Check one, two. Go! Go! Curious about real estate? Yes! Then you've come to the right place. Get the knowledge you need. Get over the fear and get started. This is the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show with your host, Michael Quarles. Hello, everybody. Michael Quarles with Podcast 77. Today's podcast, we're answering the five questions sent in by investors like yourself. And remember, if you have a question, please send it to support at bsffacademy.com. One more time, support at bsffacademy.com. Here we go. Question number one. I live in an area in Orange County where all the surrounding cities, medium home values are 500 to 600. Do you recommend focusing on those areas as long as I stick to your guidelines regarding targeted homes at or below medium? Or should I avoid these areas and go to lower priced areas in other parts of the county? If we are listing on the MLS and there is a buyer demand, it seems as though this would be equally effective to lower priced areas. I look at it differently, maybe. I'm only concerned where, one, it's easy for me to go knock on doors kind of stuff. Now, if you're doing what we're doing, where we're not knocking on doors, we're doing everything's over the phone, it doesn't really matter where you're at kind of stuff. But if you're going to knock on doors, you have to make it easy for yourself. Let's face it, a seller's going to call you, say, come out and buy my house, and you're going to make 40 grand, and they're four hours away. Well, that's, I know it's 40 grand, but you're not 100% certain you're going to make 40 grand when you drive four hours and drive four hours back. But if it was around the corner down the street, 10, 15 minutes away, yeah, you'd make time for that. The four hours, you probably wouldn't get excited about that. So make sure it's easier wherever you're at. The other thing is high-priced areas, they work just as good as low-priced areas. People pay what they pay. And um, in fact, in the high-priced area, let's face it, in my area, Bakersfield, of one of them, you know, we're, our median is like right, 205 right now. And shoot, if, if I had a median of 500,000, I could do two and a half fewer deals and make it the same amount of money. So... Think about it that way, because let's face it, 60% of 500 and 60% of 205, when you do the math, it all equates equally. So I would have to do two and a half deals less. Or if I want to do match your production and you did a deal, I'd have to do two and a half times more, which means I'm going to have to have more marketing dollars, more people answering the phones, all that kind of good stuff. So it really doesn't matter, but stick to whatever's easier for you. Um, you're going to find especially those of you in the coaching program, you're going to find that when we get to the point of, hey, we know what we're doing. We've knocked on enough doors. We know how to value properties. We know all this stuff. Now, I don't want to go out and see a house anymore. I want to start doing what you're doing. Um, that'll be a good day for everybody. Question number two. I got a contract signed on a house. Woo! Man, that's exciting. We decided on a subject two deal at 52000 and he makes the next two payments. Congratulations. I messed up some of the contract. Not sure if I filled everything out right. That is why you're supposed to rehearse doing the contract over and over and over again. Fill it out, 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 fill it out over and over and over again. So you don't make mistakes. We're professionals. Professionals don't make mistakes. Do I schedule an inspection, start escrow and talk to my agent about it today? Yes. If you got a contract signed, make sure you did it right in the first place. But then once it's done right and you have it, let's get your agent to get it listed. Let's get your inspections started. We absolutely open up escrow because we have to get the memorandum of contract signed and notarized. My goodness, you guys hear me all the time. The next day at 10 o'clock, meet your sellers down at closing. Make sure they bring their ID cards or their driver's license that are current that shows a picture of them on it. Make sure they bring their warranty deed, grant deed, and any payment coupon that they may have. Make it easier for the title and escrow closing companies. And get that memorandum of contract signed. So, the next day, yes, you want to do all that. Question number three. I have now spoken to five or seven people. Out of those, only one has been able to give me a definite value on their property. They seem disappointed when I suggest they figure out the value and call me back. I'm concerned I'm not assessing motivation properly. It feels like I'm turning them away. No, they're turning themselves away. They are absolutely turning themselves away because if you wanted to sell something, you have an idea what it's worth. You do not get on the telephone, call someone. I say, you know, I want to sell my car and go, well, but I don't know what it's worth. Or I want to sell my piano, but I don't know what it's worth. You absolutely have an idea in your brain what you think it's worth. It may not be true, 
that's okay, but we still have to start there. And then, then the next question, of course, is what do you, what's your walk away? What, after I pay all those costs and I pay off the mortgage, what do you want to walk away with? The bottom dollar kind of stuff. And they got to know that one too, because if they don't know that one, they're just fibbing to us because no one decides to sell something unless they have a value they want to sell it for. That's like you saying, well, I'm going to go shopping, but I don't know how much money I'm going to spend. Well, most of us are going to say, no, that's not true because we have a limited amount of money we can spend on shopping. So if I'm going to go buy a pair of jeans, I have a budget that I'm going to buy a pair of jeans within. Same thing with selling something. You have a budget. You're going to work within something. We need them to tell us the truth. If they're not motivated to tell you the truth, there's nothing you can do. So you're doing a great job by asking the questions and getting rid of the people without insulting them, without creating hardship and all that kind of good stuff, because we're going to follow back up with them in 15, 30, 60, and 90. Thanks for listening to Buy, Sell, Fix, Flip. We'll be right back. Are you running out of leads? It's time you tried Yellow Letters at yellowletters.com. Get motivated seller leads through yellow letters, postcards, zip letters, typed professional letters, greeting cards, door hangers, and business cards. Yellow Letters is a full-service marketing company created with your success in mind. Get the personal attention you need to get your direct mail campaign started and get in touch at yellowletters.com. And we are back in three, three, two, two, one. one. Question number four. Just bought up subject to an existing mortgage. Man, I love my coaching students. I love them. I love them. I love them. The title company would not let me, <laughs> there's another title company, would not let me open escrow and close for them getting title insurance. Had the seller sign the deed in which I recorded. Wouldn't have done it that way. So now I'm the owner of record. Great. But you still don't have title insurance. Title company said when I get to sell, they would issue the title insurance once the existing mortgage is paid off. What is the best way to close a subject to deal? Can you get title insurance and close through a title company? I have yet to find one that does. Well, that's our job. One of the things we do is we find those people that will do the work that we want them to do for us. And you never want to break chain of title. So you always want to have title insurance. It's kind of like, you know, when you get automobile insurance and they go, who is your last carrier? And you go, oh, I haven't had automobile insurance for five years. They kind of look at you sideways and like, oh, you have it? And then they charge you more because you didn't have it because they don't know what kind of person you are. They don't know what kind of your, what your claim records are, all that kind of good stuff. Well, title insurance is title insurance. It's insurance. Same way automobile insurance is. So find the companies that will do it. Absolutely do. You know, guys, we just switched title insurance companies. We dealt with one and we had a, a purchase. Get this. Get this. We had a purchase where there was a seller on title. His wife quick claimed him the deed. They divorced in court. Court order said quick claim husband the deed. He, they did this years ago. The deed's recorded. It's part of the chain. Title insurance could see it. Title could see it. But they were really having a hard time going, hey, I don't know if we can. We need to get her to sign a memorandum or sign a, an authorization or affidavit. No, it's an affidavit. Get her to sign an affidavit that she understood what she was signing. Now, guys and gals, the court order said she had to do it. Obviously, she knew what she was doing. It had been years. Obviously, she knew what she was doing. She didn't ever make a fuss about it. But the title company I was using said, ah, we're having a hard time with this one. No, you're not. Yes, we are. So I said, okay, I'll just go find another one. So I found someone that would. Went to that title company. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with this. We'll do this. That's not a big deal. Are you serious? Yep, no, we're ser not serious at all. We'll, well, we are serious. We will do this. So I switched title companies just like that. So it happens to all of us. We just got to find the people that do the deals the way we want them done. And if we're right, we're right. That's all there is to it. If we're right, we're right. If we're doing it morally, ethically, and legally, then we're right. Question number five. I'm thinking of doing a mail out to a small track of landowners so that I can do a small gated community, which is desperately needed in my community. What kind of mail piece would you send? It would be the landowners who own the, for a minimum time frame, I'm guessing 10 years, free and clear, 15 to 30 acres. I would just send them a postcard that says I would buy vacant land or raw land. That's all. I would just, it was just a simple postcard. Just send it. The, the lists are easy to get. 
So just send it. Send it over and over and over and over again because they're not look at, they're not, they may miss it the first time. Mix it up. Make it a bit different color on the second one. Make it, you know, orange on the first one, pink on the second one, green on the third one kind of stuff. Just do it. Just It's no big deal. Find them. But you know what? The other thing that you can do is start looking at the commercial side of stuff. You know, put some feelers out um, on who knows who might have some property for sale. Um, start looking at some of the ag and some of the um, how your city's evolving. Is it evolving? You know, is it, is it gobbling up ag? And, and maybe there's a farmer that, you know, may want to be selling before long or something like that. Go, go say hello to them. But do some research. I mean, you're talking about development here, 20, 30 acres. You're probably looking at 30 acres. You're, you're probably looking at 60 houses. Um, not a bad little gig. So uh, you're going to make some money on it. Spend some time. Hope all that made sense. And if, if you guys thought that my mind wasn't in this podcast, it, it kind of wasn't a little bit. And my doggie died on me on Friday. I just wanted to use the end of the podcast to say goodbye. She, um, seven days. All it took for her to be alive and running around, playing, licking, licking way too much. Riley just loved licking faces and heads, and I'm bald. And she thought that was like an ice cream treat or something. Every time I got home, she'd come over and lick my head, like, like seemed like for hours. But she'd just have a good time at it, you know. And you know, she was such a beautiful dog and such a family dog. In fact, I taught her to say, I love you. In dog talk, because she, she would, she was a boxer, so she had she had this like this long bark, and so she could almost say, well, a couple times she actually did say "I love you," but it would take we'd practice for hours and hours and hours, and um, cute little tail. I mean, her tail was only like an inch long, but she would just wag that thing like it was a windmill. Man, every time someone she knew walked in the house, she was like. Oh, my goodness gracious, they walked in the house to give me love. Come over to you and just, just want to be just the friendliest little thing. Going to absolutely miss Riley. It's kind of crazy to, to like a dog so much. But I have my other little dog, Precious. She's kind of lonely now. She um, doesn't know what to do. Precious spent her nights, she kind of equally... She'd fall asleep with Riley because, you know, Riley would lick, lick her ears. And Riley was an ear licker and Precious is an eyeball licker. Go figure. So they take turns cleaning each other's ears and eyeballs. And um, then about 1 o'clock in the morning, Precious would come run up on bed and get under bed and go tunnel under the covers and sleep at her feet. So Precious is kind of wondering what the routine's supposed to be now. But... It's just hard. If you guys have an animal and you've lost it, man, it's tough. Till next time. Thanks for listening to the Michael Quarles Real Estate Show. Get more info and stay in touch at michaelquarles.com.